When I was a young man growing up in New York City, I refused to pledge allegiance to the flag. Of course, I was sent to the principal's office, and he asked me, why don't you want to pledge allegiance? Everybody does. I said, everybody once believed the earth was flat, but that doesn't make it so. I explained that America owed everything it has to other cultures and other nations, and that I would rather pledge allegiance to the earth and everyone on it. Needless to say, it wasn't long before I left school entirely. And I set up a lab in my bedroom. There I began to learn about science and nature. I realized then that the universe is governed by laws and that the human being, along with society itself, was not exempt from these laws. Then came the crash of 1929, which began what we now call the Great Depression. I found it difficult to understand why millions were out of work, homeless, starving, while all the factories were sitting there. The resources were unchanged. It was then that I realized that the rules of the economic game were inherently invalid. Shortly after came World War II, where various nations took turns systematically destroying each other. I later calculated that all the destruction and wasted resources spent on that war could have easily provided for every human need on the planet. Since that time, I have watched humanity set the stage for its own extinction. I have watched as the precious finite resources are perpetually wasted and destroyed in the name of profit and free markets. I have watched the social values of society be reduced into a base artificiality of materialism and mindless consumption. And I have watched as the monetary powers control the political structure of supposedly free societies. I'm 94 years old now, and I'm afraid my disposition is the same as it was 75 years ago. This shit's got to go. Welcome to Machine! In society today, you seldom hear anyone speak of the progress of their country or society in terms of their physical well-being, state of happiness, trust, or social stability. Rather, the measures are presented to us through economic abstractions. We have the gross domestic product, the consumer price index, the value of the stock market, rates of inflation, and so on. But does this tell us anything of real value as to the quality of people's lives? No, all these measures have to do with the money sequence itself and nothing more. For example, the gross domestic product of a country is a measure of the value of goods and services sold. This measure is claimed to correlate to the standard of living of a country's people. In the United States, health care accounted for over 17% of GDP in 2009, amounting to over 2.5 trillion spent, hence creating a positive effect on this economic measure. And based on this logic, it would be even better for the U.S. economy if health care services increased more so, perhaps to $3 trillion or $5 trillion, since that would create more growth, more jobs, and hence boasted by economists as a rise in their country's standard of living. But, wait a minute, what do healthcare services actually represent? Well, sick and dying people. That's right, the more unhealthy people there are in America, the better the economy. Now, that is not an exaggeration or a cynical perspective. In fact, if we step back far enough, you will realize that the GDP not only doesn't reflect real public or social health on any tangible level, it is, in fact, mostly a measure of industrial inefficiency and social degradation. And the more you see it rise, the worse things are becoming with respect to personal, social, and environmental integrity. So what exactly does this economic paradigm call for? What is it that keeps our economic system going? Consumption. Or more accurately, cyclical consumption. 
When we break down the foundation of classic market economics, we are left with a pattern of monetary exchange that simply cannot be allowed to stop or even substantially slowed if the society as we know it is to remain operational. There are three main actors on the economic stage, the employee, the employer, and the consumer. The employee sells labor to the employer for income. The employer sells its production services and hence goods to the consumer for income. And the consumer, of course, is simply another role of the employer and employee, spending back into the system to enable the cyclical consumption to continue. In other words, the global market system is based on the assumption that there will always be enough product demand in society to move enough money around at a rate which can keep the consumption process going. And the faster the rate of consumption, the more so-called economic growth is assumed, and so the machine goes. But hold on, I thought an economy was meant to, I don't know, economize? Doesn't the very term have to do with preservation and efficiency and a reduction of waste? So how does our system which demands consumption and the more the better efficiently preserve or economize at all? Well, it doesn't. The intent of the market system is in fact the exact opposite of what a real economy is supposed to do, which is efficiently and conservatively orient the materials for production and distribution of life supporting goods. We live on a finite planet with finite resources, where, for example, the oil we utilize took millions of years to develop, where the minerals we use took billions of years to develop. So, having a system that deliberately promotes the acceleration of consumption for the sake of so-called economic growth is pure, ecocidal insanity. You know, if there is any testament to the plasticity of the human mind, if there is any proof to how malleable human thought is and how easily conditioned and guided people can become based on the nature of their environmental stimulus and what it reinforces, the world of commercial advertising is the proof. You have to stand in awe at the level of brainwashing where these programmed robots known as consumers wander the landscape only to walk into a store and spend, say, four thousand dollars on a handbag that likely cost ten dollars to make in a sweatshop overseas only for the brand status it supposedly represents in the culture or perhaps the ancient communal traditions which increase trust and cohesiveness in society which have now been hijacked by acquisitive materialistic values where now annually we exchange useless crap a few times a year and we might wonder why so many today have a compulsion to shopping and acquisition when it is clear that they have been conditioned from childhood to expect material goods as a sign of their status with friends and family. The fact is, the foundation of any society are the values that support its operation. And our society, as it exists, can only operate if our values support the conspicuous consumption it requires to continue the market system. 75 years ago, consumption in America and much of the first world was half of what we see today per person. Today's new consumer culture has been manufactured and imposed due to the very real need for higher and higher levels of consumption. And this is why most corporations now spend more money on advertising than the actual process of product creation itself. They work diligently to create a false need for you to fill and it happens to work. There's an old saying that the competitive market model seeks to create the best possible goods at the lowest possible prices. This statement is essentially the incentive concept which justifies market competition based on the assumption that the result is the production of higher quality goods. If I was going to build myself a table from scratch, I would naturally build it out of the best, most durable materials possible, right? With the intent for it to last as long as possible. Why would I want to make something poor knowing I would have to eventually do it again and expend more materials and more energy? Well, as rational as that may seem in the physical world, when it comes to the market world, it is not only explicitly irrational, it is not even an option. 
It is technically impossible to produce the best of anything if a company is to maintain a competitive edge and hence remain affordable to the consumer. Literally everything created and set for sale in the global economy is immediately inferior the moment it is produced, for it is a mathematical impossibility to make the most scientifically advanced, efficient and strategically sustainable products. This is due to the fact that the market system requires that cost efficiency or the need to reduce expenses exist at every stage of production from the cost of labor to the cost of materials and packaging and so on. This competitive strategy of course is to make sure the public buys their goods rather than from a competing producer which is doing the exact same thing to also make their goods both competitive and affordable. This immutably wasteful consequence of the system could be termed intrinsic obsolescence. However, this is only one part of a larger problem. A fundamental governing principle of market economics, one that you will not find in any textbook, by the way, is the following. Nothing produced can be allowed to maintain a lifespan longer than what can be endured in order to continue cyclical consumption. In other words, it is critical that stuff break down, fail, and expire within a certain amount of time. This is termed planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence is the backbone of the underlying market strategy of every goods producing corporation in existence. While very few, of course, would admit to such a strategy outright, what they do is mask it within the intrinsic obsolescence phenomenon just discussed, while often ignoring or even suppressing new advents in technology which might create a more sustainable, durable good. So, if it wasn't wasteful enough that the system inherently cannot allow the most durable and efficient goods to be produced, planned obsolescence deliberately recognizes that the longer any good is in operation, the worse it is for sustaining cyclical consumption and hence the market system itself. In other words, product sustainability is actually inverse to economic growth and hence there is a direct reinforced incentive to make sure lifespans are short of any given good produced. And in fact, the system cannot operate any other way. One glance at the sea of landfills now spreading across the world show the obsolescence reality. There are now billions of cheaply made cell phones, computers and other technology, each full of precious, difficult to mine materials such as gold, coltan, copper, now rotting in vast piles usually due to the mere malfunction or obsolescence of small parts which in a conservative society could likely be fixed or updated and the life of the good extended unfortunately as efficient as that may seem in our physical reality living on a finite planet with finite resources it is explicitly inefficient with respect to the market to put it into a phrase efficiency sustainability and preservation are the enemies of our economic system. Likewise, just as physical goods need to be constantly produced and reproduced regardless of their environmental impact, the service industry operates with an equal rationale. The fact is, there is no monetary benefit to resolving any problems which are currently being serviced. At the end of the day, the last thing the medical establishment really wants is the curing of diseases such as cancer which would eliminate countless jobs and trillions in revenue. And since we're on the subject, crime and terrorism in this system are good. Well, at least economically, for it is employing police, generating high-value commodities for security, not to mention the value of prisons that are privately owned for profit. And how about war? The war industry in America is a huge driver of GDP, one of the most profitable industries producing weapons of death and destruction. The favorite game of this industry is to blow things up and then go and rebuild them for profit. We saw this with the windfall billion dollar contracts made from the Iraq war. The bottom line is that socially negative attributes of society have become positively rewarded ventures for industry. And any interest in problem resolution or environmental sustainability and conservation is intrinsically counter to economic sustainability. And this is why every time you see the GDP rise in any country you are witnessing an increase in necessity 
whether real or contrived. And by definition, a necessity is rooted in inefficiency. Hence, increased necessity means increased inefficiency.